Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, we're going to be talking to John Iver. John works for BandLab, which is a free social music creation platform. It's really cool, especially for beginners, but it can also be pretty useful for more seasoned uh, music producers if you want to try some interesting new sounds and um, export your stems into your DAW of choice. I think it's really cool. So we talk a lot with John about the platform BandLab, but we also get into some other more philosophical stuff and I think it's especially interesting when we start talking about sound design and also interfaces and how interface design affects how we use the products we use. Um, we get very used to the look and feel of a product, whether it's our DAW, our plugins, or what have you, but that really affects how we use it. So there's a pretty interesting conversation around that too. Before we get started, I want to invite you to check out my site, brianfunk.com, where I release Ableton Live packs, sample packs, tutorials, and a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And maybe check out the Music Production Club. The Music Production Club is a monthly subscription that gives you a steady stream of music production tools to use in your own music. It's kind of my pride and joy. I put my latest and greatest stuff in there. Currently, during this month right now, if you join, you get a brand new Korg MS-20 Ableton Live pack. You'd get my live performance in Ableton Live video course, an Ableton Live performance template for live performances. You'd get the Fat Moog Bass Volume 1 Ableton Live pack. You get the entire archive of my free Ableton Live packs, which is the first 175 of them. There's also the Music Production Exclusive pack, which gives you another whole collection of sounds from... Stuff you can only get by joining the club. And something I'm really excited about is that I've just set up a Music Production Club Discord server. Discord is like a chat platform, and we can use this to ask each other questions, share tips, share our music, share samples. There's musical homework challenges. We can set up collaborations. And much more, as we think of it, we can add it to the channel. I'm really excited about building this community because that's really my favorite thing about the Music Production Club is having this community of producers. So you can check all of that out at brianfunk.com mpc. On today's episode, I'm sitting with John Ivers, and John is a Bay Area composer. He's a clarinetist, a sound artist, an improviser, a uh, musician. I'm, I'm reading from his bio a little bit here. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> sound familiar? <laughs> I, was, I was like, where did he get this? <laughs> <laughs> but um, quite, a, quite a lineup of uh, accomplishments and achievements and worked with so many different ensembles. Um, and he's also a part of BandLab, which is an online DAW. I, this is what I'm going to say. You may correct me. But it's an online oh, DAW. Yeah. It's free. Um, it, it seems very into um, education, which is something I'm you know, pretty excited about myself. And um, I think it's a really nice tool to kind of like a gateway for people to get into music production. And um, it looks like it has some cool social aspects as well. So oh, yeah. before I start rambling too much, I'll let you tell us. Uh, hi, John. How's it going? <laughs> hi, hi. That was a great introduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm John, and um, yeah, I'm the musical content and creation lead at BandLab right now, and um, I also work like really closely on the product team and kind of bringing a lot of our um, specifically like musical creation um, products out to to users. Um, so that ranges from you know, working with sound designers to make loops and one shots to, you know, deciding that we need to introduce new effects or improve our mastering or something like this. Um, and uh, yeah, you got BandLab is exactly as described. Um, I think the tagline is BandLab is an all in one social music creation platform. Um, but what that basically means is, um, in one place, we sort of support artists and sharing their music and collaborating with each other, as well as sort of offering them direct tools in the browser and um, especially on like um, Android and iOS phones. So you can sort of record and create mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, and definitely as part of that, we uh, education is a big part of that because, you know, we think that this type of uh, like music creation is really good in schools and is like really valuable like life tools so that's a service that we we have a special education service um for people interested in using mm. in classrooms so um yeah uh yeah it's it's kind of, it almost like to me looks like a, a daw and a 
a sort of like SoundCloud band camp type of thing all rolled into one. Yeah, definitely. Because the, the social stuff, it's nice how everything's kind of connected. Um, and, yeah. and the community aspect seems like a really important part of what you guys are doing. Yeah, I think so. I think um, we we offer like, I think combining the social aspect of it, because I, th- I personally think music is like inherently social, you know, mm-hmm. it can, you can make it by yourself, but it's like to be listened to. It's some form of yeah. communication. So like combining um, some creation tools with like a community that you can build within the platform. And um, it like that, like hybrid state really creates a lot of like, you know, positive experiences for our users, I think, because they can sort of like, we can, they can fork a track, you know, if somebody made a track and is looking for somebody to like rap over it, they can just mm-hmm. like do it on their phone and try out stuff and chat with their collaborator, you know? Um, and so we have a few different ways of, of like supporting this collaboration socially. Like you can create a band, you can invite, you can start projects and invite individual people to work on it. So say I open um, the mix editor, which is our DAW, and I made some loops, made a cool track. I can save it and invite my friend who lives across the world and he'll have the session exactly as I left it with all of the tracks and everything for him or to just work on, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's like a, that ease of, of like communicating with people and also creating music, uh, is really like what makes band that special, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so because you get excited with your friends about it. Yeah, and a lot of like, um, you know, I work with high school students. In case people don't know, but um, and a lot of, to a lot of them, I mean, despite the fact that they have the internet and they can go look, uh, music creation is a mystery. Like, yeah. how does this get done? So, there's a lot of people that might be interested in it, but they don't know where to go. And if you start like you know, Googling and you get into like the, the, like, um, you know, the, the industry standards of like pro tools Mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, it's, it's daunting. It's a lot. And it's kind of like, how do I even start doing that? Yeah. I mean, like in my own, I remember first getting into music production and like, I got reason and I love Mm -hmm. reason, you know? And, but it's like, it's so, it was so complicated to me, Mm -hmm. like to, you know, um, to figure out, to even get to the point of like starting to make something that sounds good. And so one of the, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to say you, you need to understand synthesis and like routing and um, you it's reason is cool in that it's like mirrors a real studio and a real rack. Yeah. You sort of need to know that. Yeah. It's super powerful, but you know, as somebody who is seeing like what people are making on band that right now, it's like a, generation of creators that has no connection to the physical studio maybe Mm. or like when we're talking about physical gear it could be like synthesizers or like microphones or smaller production setups and like i think band lab's kind of a perfect place to get started with like seeing like oh like i can just play a keyboard in the browser and i can record it and really simply like get the concept of what midi is because midi is also like what is if you search midi on wikipedia it's super confusing yes. for people who don't know it um and yeah same with effects so we kind of always try and offer these tools like here's pre-made loops here's stuff that sounds good that's easy to use we'll pitch shift it and time stretch it behind the scenes so that it always sounds good for you to get started and then, you know, people who really like become familiar with the tools can use it in more powerful ways, like automation or multi-track recording or, mm. you know, more standard DAW features. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, we've had a lot of like people who are just starting their musical journeys, like start with BandLab. And that, I think that's like a really powerful thing um, to, you know, make a product for, I think. it It's an amazing gift, really. Um, if Yeah. You know, um, if if somebody gets involved into making music because of that, um, whereas maybe they would have got stuck somewhere along the way and decided it was too difficult or too hard. I came from the world of yeah. playing instruments, playing the guitar, and um, it wasn't until, uh, I don't know, probably I was um, early 20s. You know, I'd been playing guitar probably about 
10 years at that point before I ever really even heard about MIDI and the computer. And you know, I'd seen some keyboards had this like yeah. weird connector that kind of looked like a video game, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, socket or something, controller or something. But uh, yeah. I didn't know what MIDI was at all. And um, it, it took a little while. I'm re I remember that like struggle of like trying to understand that, oh, it's just data. It's just information. And it's, yeah. It's, um, but I didn't get that just until I data. was yeah. already pretty deep. You know? Yeah. It's easier to like intuitively understand what, you know, oh, I move this rectangle and it changes the pitch. But like as a standard, it's, um, it takes some time for people to sort of get that. Yeah, I remember my first sort of music recording setup were these old Alesis ADATs. Oh, I had those, that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, and I had one of the XTs and one uh -huh. of just the normal ones I got for like a couple hundred bucks. And then I, you know, <laughs> on like, you can't even give those away now. <laughs> you know, recording it onto a VHS with an old mixer. And it had this little controller on it that looked just like a Nintendo thing yeah. for like moving uh, to and different like spots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and like, and then I got a little inbox we were talking about and like, and then pro tools was like, Oh my gosh, like mm. this is so easy. And, and now I'm thinking like, I used to think pro tools was easy and like, mm -hmm. um, that's really saying something like at this point, um, yeah. because our, you know, um, there's a lot more support for, you know, making products that, um, can serve like a, wider bandwidth of users, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like professional and introductory users. So. Right. Yeah. I did the same thing. Like I, I had like cassette recorders and then we were, my friend had a karaoke machine that we figured out a way where we could play it on, play a track on one tape and then record it onto another tape while we sang into the microphone and it would like sort of Oh, do yeah. an overdub type of thing, but you lost so much quality on the original. <laughs> uh, then it was the four track tape recorder. Yeah. But my buddy well, of mine and I, we saved all our sound. money, and it was the very first thing. It was it was the very first thing we ever bought on eBay was two blackface ADATs and a mixer. And, oh yeah, uh, and, and that we were like, this is amazing. We are kings because yeah, we, we super recorded cool, yeah. our band in a someone's home studio in the basement and he had ADATs. This was, I think, like 97. And we felt like we were in the studio, oh, yeah. you know, like no one had oh, basement yeah. studios. <laughs> so it was really exciting. And those 16 tracks of digital tape recording. Mm -hmm. Can't beat that for a, a high school band. That's Oh my God. Yeah, I remember bringing in our CD to school. It was before people were burning CDs, really. And like... We felt like hot shit. <laughs> you yeah. know, we were really excited. <laughs> we were really proud of it. Yeah. And uh, not too long after that, you know, things like really changed. Yeah, That's things really, we live in a totally different world. Even thinking about data loss, like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know where my old CDs and ADAT tapes are. But, you know, with something like BandLab, you, it's just like you record something and it's in the cloud forever and you can download it on any device. And that's like a... Um, that yeah, the ease of like dealing with audio files is yeah. crazy right now. Yeah. Oh, I, I can relate to that convenience because uh, even uh, just a couple months ago, a hard drive of mine failed with my old ADAT recordings on it. Oh, no. With old like Pro Tools session, which I'm not even sure how I'd even access anymore because I don't even know yeah. if I can open them. But I, I lost, I lost a lot of like my early stuff. I hadn't looked at it in 10 years either. So who knows if I ever would have looked at it again. But um, I it's think still it's still a sad loss. It is, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. I have a friend um, who thinks maybe we can install it in an old computer, and maybe, but uh, uh, yeah. he's kind of like, don't, this is a, this will be lucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah back we don't up have your to stuff, deal with that anymore. <laughs> yeah, back up your stuff to get mini hard drives. Put it in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, and don't lose your password. So, <laughs> so, so that's nice that um, with BandLab, uh, everything goes there. And like you said, there's no like I guess compatibility issues with um, 
Because because I don't think it uses like uh, plugins necessarily, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, this is an interesting point to sort of bring up at, at this point in the conversation because um, we're kind of talking about older technologies mm-hmm. and like um, one of and you know more traditional recording technologies. But one of the yeah, like I was mentioning that um, you know we're really like a mobile based company, which is you know also something that's shifted in the music industry. Yeah, I think. You know, that we have like a ton of people like producing good music on their Android phones is like pretty incredible. And part of that is like, you know, having these cloud technologies that I think we think should be standard. That like when you record tracks, uh, when you in BandLab on my Android phone, I can open them in the web browser later. Or I have, you know, I can open every saved version of my project. So if I like deleted an audio sample last week and I'm like, oh man, I really needed that. You know, you can go back to that version of your revision and, you know, still access all of your files. Um, And it's just, Mm -hmm. it's there. You can download the stems. Um, We have tools called like BandLab Assistant, which will sync files on your desktop. So if you're like, you know, using BandLab for, you know, storing your session audio files or you want to, and you want to access them in Ableton or something totally possible. Um, so we're kind of, yeah, there's no, there's no limit and you don't have to pay for it. So (laughs) it's a, yeah, if you're, yeah, even just storing tracks and promoting them, it's a great place because you'll always have the file. Mm. Yeah. That's a really cool thing that it is, um, that accessible and, and free to everybody where the bar is really low, there's kind of no excuse not to try yeah. it. How does BandLab survive then? Like, um, how does the company work in that case? It's, it's beautiful a, that things can be, Yeah, we're in a very a reality, good, you know? Yeah, we're in a very good, yeah, that's, that question always comes up. So um, yeah, we're in a really beautiful position as like a product team to be able to like make this application in, in the way that, you know, we think it's really going to be impactful for users. And that means like, you know, it's free and um, we don't have advertising, which is, you know, and right now it's about like building the community and like, um, you know, building the tools for that community. And um, BandLab is also part of like a larger umbrella company with some, um, we make some physical goods and really, reissues of harmony guitars and the heritage guitars and um, Tysco pedals as well as a few publications and so we're kind of in a global level like trying to rethink you know more than just music production but like how people um, interface like in the musical world so through like you know that idea of like publication selling high quality instruments and like offering tools for people to create, you know, I think the more people that are making music, the better for the music industry as a whole. And there's a lot of value like in that, uh, Mm -hmm. I think for us as a company. Um, So that it's. (laughs) Yeah. That's well, that makes sense. It kind of gets people in and then, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's a strategy I've used. Um, with uh, what I do with my sound design, with um, I make a lot of uh, Ableton Live packs, and yeah. I started doing free ones. You know, it's kind of unintentional how it all started. I just put one online and said, "Hey, download this if you want." And people did. And no yeah. one had ever downloaded anything from me before. <laughs> yeah, free stuff. People like free stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but that's like uh, you know, kind of like it's a way, like because I I think a lot of artists like get a little weirded out about like selling things and being uh-huh. businesses. So it's a nice way to like, kind of, you know, feel like you're not being not, and I'm not saying being a business person is sleazy, but that's, no, that's no. like the thing the artist has. Like, I don't, I don't believe that at all, but it, it helps you feel like a little better about it. I, I'd like that. I can I say so. like, Hey, if you can't get this thing I'm selling, you know, I got a whole bunch of other free stuff. Maybe you want to check out. Yeah. Uh, you know, like as a, um, I just, I love like the sort of in the past decade, like how popular, like, you know, pay free with optional payment for albums, like this kind of like, um, Patreon, these sort of like different, you know, because the, I think like musicians, um, at least in my experience, like it's like a story, you're a story and you have, Mm. 
and it's not like a brand, you know, sometimes it's brands and this big thing, but it's like, you want to like promote your ideas and you have to do that in many different ways. Um, right. You know, all these different social media platforms and like, you want to, you know, allow people to see what you're working on as much as possible. And I think like, you know, a lot of that is just having people like listen to your content or like be exposed to what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so making things free is, can be good. It's also not, you know, I, we worry sometimes, I worry sometimes about like, if something is free, does it mean it's bad quality? Because that's like, you know, a common, I think like psychological thing, but um, you know, at Band Lab, we're just, we're trying to make the best stuff, you know, and it's currently free. Um, speaking of loops though, we could talk about some of the loops on Band Lab because there's, I work sort of started in building that library and now we have like around 10,000 loops that are free. So, mm-hmm. and like pretty accessible, like on all of our platforms and like for users, um, on the desktop application, uh, Band Lab Assistant. Um, so that's just something, you know, if you're looking for all sorts of different genres, samples, um, loops, like easy way to create some tracks, like definitely you can check it out on band lab and, um, they're all, you know, free to use. So nice. So that's really like a resource for anybody, even if they're yeah, technically not uh, gonna maybe do their song in band lab, they can at least maybe build some stuff with some loops. And then, like you said, you can get access to the files and. You yeah, that's, like. that's one of my, for education, that's like one of my main, like beginning examples of mm-hmm. like how you can get, you know, we're talking about the ease of creating music. And so we have this other platform briefly mentioned called Band Lab for Education, which is kind of like a garden walled band lab. So you don't have all of the social functions because you don't really want that for um, schools. You know, it's mm-hmm. well, and like in the U S it's not even legal to do that. So we, you know, we have a separate sort of like moderated environment and platform mm-hmm. for specifically for education. Um, but I, I did a lecture at UC Irvine where we were teaching like intro to music technology. And I did a few lectures. It's like a gen ed class. I, yeah. Like at least a hundred students in it, like a big gen ed music class. And they all logged right. in on Chrome into band lab and I just showed them like, Hey, here's the loop library. Let's drag and drop some loops. And like mm-hmm. one of the special things about band lab is because we are providing the content and app and we know all of its data. We, you know, pitch shift it and time stretch it to match it. So you can choose any loops and anything. And we'll just like kind of make it sound good. We'll go to the right relative minor nice. or major. And like all of a sudden you have a, like a room full of a hundred students who like just produced a track. Right. you know, in just a couple minutes. And then it's like, oh my gosh, this is fun. This is engaging. This sounds good, mm. you know? And then within the platform, they can start to be like, well, what does it mean to like make a drum beat? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about MIDI. Like, mm-hmm. you know, let's, let's make loops right now, you know? Let's deconstruct it that way. So it's, it's, a, it's super fun to make things that are super easy and sound good. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool because it cuts out so many of the barriers of like uh, music theory and um, mm-hmm. you know understanding keys and scales and time signatures. So, yeah, like, which I think I, I also all important. Like my background is in you know studying composition, so I, uh-huh. I you know having to do so many <laughs> counterpoint and music theory and sight singing orchestration classes. You know, uh, I got tired of it, but it definitely it's worth you know learning about some. But, you know, yeah. band labs maybe not the place for that type of um, conservative or like more traditional like music learning. Well, that's so. kind of something I was going to ask you about. And I guess we can just kind of go there a little bit. Oh, yeah. It's like, um, you know, you have like this, like, you know, quite a lot of things you're doing in, in like a more maybe traditional academic mm-hmm. musical approach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I I have found um, that there is sort of this, I guess maybe it depends who you work with, but there's like a resistance to some of the newer technologies. You know, we want to keep our traditional thing. And, and I get that. That's totally mm-hmm. cool. You know, there's a, like, it's a tradition and it's something worth saving. And um, But sometimes I think that schools are really only catering to that aspect of um, 
young kids. Like for, for me, yeah. like I was in seventh grade taking a general music class, probably not too dissimilar from what you did the presentation for. And I hated it. I, I, I really yeah. hated it. And I didn't understand it either. We were duple meter, triple meter. And I'm like, what? And and like, yeah. we'd be clapping. Like, and I was a good student. Like I learned things in math and English and science, but I, I, I it, that was a class that I just got through and it did not help my appreciation for music. And the thing yeah. is just about a year and a half later, I got introduced to the guitar and changed my life and music became a central part. And I just see myself as this yeah. like ripe fruit. I was right there. Like I didn't know it, but yeah. I, if I was, would have just been turned in the right direction, I, I might've really taken to that in seventh grade a little earlier. Mm -hmm. So I really relate to like a lot of the kids at school where I teach too, where they're not going to be the kid playing say the trombone or, um, you know, in the choir, but they're into music and they want to make music and there's not a lot of options for them. Yeah. There's such a, like, I mean, yeah, my, I came to learning like the more standard notation stuff like later. Cause I was, I, I, you know, went through music production like got really into that playing guitar, like played piano some, and it made me want to learn more, you know? So I was just like, mm. you know what, I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to go as far as I can with this. Um, but like after, you know, having some like perspective, like looking back on it, it's like there's a big lack of, I think, like diversity of approaches to like how we introduce music to students. Mm. And there's a lot of, I'm in the Bay Area, actually, there's um, interesting people doing work with like improvisation and like text based scores and like graphic scores with um ensembles of uh, differently abled people and like working with elementary schools to do like what might be like considered like extreme in terms of like experimentalism mm -hmm. but i think there's like an accessibility socially to like we're going to improvise for five minutes like with our pencils mm -hmm. you know what i mean and like where this is a musical experience and like we can you know maybe you're not going to listen to it on a record but like <laughs> And maybe, I mean, it could sound great actually, but um, <laughs> like that, yeah, like introducing students first to that, like, you know, really creating thing before being like, okay, here are the boundaries that, and the hurdles that you have to overcome to do like anything great, yeah. you know, and which is kind of what I felt like my like younger music education was, was like, oh, like you have to, you have to do all of these things before like, you know, you can be good at say that you're good at something in this music industry, you know? Um, but yeah, well, I do an after school music production club once a week. And it's, oh yeah. It's about 40 minutes, um, once a week. And we have Ableton live and a whole bunch of push controllers that, um, uh -huh. Ableton did a big education initiative a couple of years back when they released Push 2. It was like, send in your old Push, we'll give you a discount on the new Push, and we'll donate your old Push to schools, which is oh, that's super great. awesome. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, I'm really happy I got to get in on that. And it's, you know, having the push there is, is a big help because it's it's touch the buttons, it lights up, you know, and yeah. like you, you hear what you do a little more. And it's, but it's still got a lot of the kind of like musical, technical things you got to get around mm -hmm. a little bit. Like sometimes, and I always emphasize to the, to the kids, like you don't need to know music theory, but I have to feel you out a little bit. Like, do you understand yeah. what I mean by like a quarter note or, or um, a bar of music or root note yeah. or scale? And sometimes like kids are just like, I'm like, all right, don't even worry about it. You don't even need to know it. Well, I'll, I'll get you around it. Um, but the goal is like, let's have you have fun doing it first. And yeah. then the questions will come up because that's how it worked with me. I mean, I, I learned how to play a Metallica song <laughs> and yeah. then, and then I wanted to learn another song. And then I, I would say like, well, okay, how do I play a solo over this? Or how do I, mm -hmm. you know, all those questions come up, you know, and um, yeah. how do I write my own song? Yeah. It's kind of like exploring. Are you like, you, and after your inspiration, you know, it's like wanting to dig deeper into your process. Um, and that's when like, yeah, you can like, I think students can learn a lot is when they're like 
passionate about the thing that they're doing. Yeah, you know, they have that obviously. Yeah. Genuine curiosity. Yeah, there we go. That's the terminology. But I think about like it's like fishing. You need to catch the fish with the bait. And yeah. Hook. I feel like in my music theory class, they were like just asking me to jump in the boat and like yeah. get caught myself, and then <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, so I like the idea, like like these technologies that allow the stuff to be pitch shifted and time stretched mm -hmm. automatically. And, you know, you don't like kind of like, don't worry about that stuff right now. Like that's, there's an aspect yeah. to it, but we can do something fun that sounds good. Yeah, right totally. away. And, and like when those um, functions are easy to use, it also means that when you become a more advanced user, you can fine tune the pitch shifting or the mm -hmm. time stretching of your samples. You know, there's a, a clear path for mm -hmm. when, you know, you're like, oh, if I do pitch this up seven semitones in Ableton, it like sounds like a fifth. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, this that's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a yeah. Um, but that's a really difficult thing to explain to someone like on day one. Yeah, no, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna. The, they won't come back <laughs> unless yeah. I don't know. There's like a cute girl in the class or something. <laughs> I... <laughs> like it's just not enough. And it's intimidating. Uh -huh. um, so I might. Well, you gotta try. You gotta try band lab. I might education. introduce you gotta that. Try some loops. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I. You should give me some feedback. We, I'd love. You know, it's always. We've gotten to work, um, and have a lot of feedback from like teachers directly on that, mm -hmm. on like what kind of features and like how things should work for the classroom setting. And so it's been, um, it's been really great for me to kind of witness that. I think and like how engaged teachers are with like wanting to have a different approach to teaching music that incorporates technology because of course technology is super important in our lives today yeah and and they like uh, you know interested enough to like give us feedback and like try and help us make something that like is gonna you know be impactful in classrooms so mm. yeah so it's yeah any feedback or we love it yeah i'll, I'll try to see uh i always have to worry about the filters <laughs> on the school oh, computers, yeah. but uh, yeah, if I can get to it, I'll, I'll introduce it to my club next week. And um, you know, if anyone wants to play around with it, go ahead. It's very, um, it's a loose thing. The club, like, it's not strict that you have to be there every week. Oh yeah. So it's a little difficult to like build on things. Yeah. And and also the once a week for. 40 minutes which is really more like a half hour by the time everyone gets in their seats yeah it, it's um it's hard to really you, you know you really need more time more consistently unfortunately yeah. but um that could be just a cool thing though even because I don't, I don't really care i don't they don't need to use ableton they don't need to use garage band they they don't need to use whatever i just want you come have fun make some music and um, however far you want to take that, I'll I'll help you get there. That's kind of my mm -hmm. approach to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll definitely do that. <laughs> I'll try it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to hearing how it goes. <laughs> so, um, you said you're in, in charge of um content creation. Yes. And the sounds. So, are you making sounds and producing loops yourself for the you know the platform? I um. Yeah, I guess I've been at Banab about four years and I came on um, sort of at first really as a sound designer mm -hmm. and kind of like giving a lot of product feedback. We have a great team and we didn't have a whole lot of like pro user or like musicians in the team. And so I kind of got in early and like, hey, like we should add panning, you know, mm -hmm. like we, they're, you know, we're building the product from the ground up. And a, a lot of that was like, we need sounds, you know you got to have a piano for people to play. You got to have drum machines. You got to have loops, you know, if you're going to have a DAW. Mm. And um, so, yeah, since I, I've started, so I very heavily worked on the sound design aspects of like most of our um, early samples and loop packs. And now I'm working almost completely on like the product side of things. So I still work with like funneling content onto the platform and like working with a team of sound designers and um, working like hands-on on like the products that those things go into. Mm. So like, you know, we have drum pads or like, you know, MIDI editing or, you know, um, I do a lot of work with the effects and like how 
um, like what effects we have and like what the interfaces are and like what all the display data is, all the minutia of having many different parameters to adjust. Um, but yeah, so, but my background, yeah, is definitely like strongly in, in sound design and audio engineering, just like in terms of my career. Um, um, it was, it was a lot to, at the beginning, we had to make a lot of samples with really no budget. And like, it was such an interesting journey to have, like, I have a few synthesizers, like I gotta, you know, I, I'm getting all these requests for sounds like from these pop tracks and just like, I got so good at sort of like deconstructing mm. different sounds and like reconstructing them in, um, you know, whatever software synth or tools I was using at the time. And that was like, you know, such good ear training, I think. And just like yeah. learning how to listen and be like, okay, like how many oscillators does this sound actually have? Like, it, you know, mm. and it, it, so it was a, it was a fun experience, but sadly as things go, I am, I am not doing, um, definitely most of my time is not spent designing sounds currently. Mm. Oh, I bet that's great ear training. There, there's like a lot of ways to do ear training too. Like, um, oh, yeah. w- when I was learning guitar, like you were just trying to kind of figure out the songs, you know, what chords are they playing? What notes are they playing? But then it was also like, well, how do they get that tone? And then that's like yeah. a different sort of sound design. And yeah, like timbral listening. Yeah. And like with synthesizers, as I started getting into that, that was a whole new world of excitement. Um, but something I never really did, I've only done it once or twice, really, which is a shame because I thought it was a really good exercise was trying to recreate songs in the uh-huh. DAW. Like 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 you would learn a song on guitar. I would learn a lot of Nirvana songs and I would figure those out and that's how I learned guitar. But it never really occurred to me, how come we don't really do that in the DAW? Like, mm. let's try to recreate this song. Yeah. You know, the beat, you like all the sounds and the beats. and so. Yeah, it's a good exercise. It, it becomes trying and like i think every time i you know it's like oh like i'm spending so much time and energy on like making somebody else's project but like mm-hmm. um it, yeah it, to sort of be in that mindset for like a year basically of like playing catch up on like what sounds were available and like learning how to produce like in so many different genres you know yeah. that's like one of the things about being a sound designer is like you have to you know it's like you gotta do lo-fi hip-hop right now you know Mm -hmm. that's a big but you also like might need to make like you know country guitar leads or you know how what tools do you need how do you approach this and um it's yeah it's an interesting sort of a lot of interesting problem solving uh, with Mm. that well how do you guys balance i mean it's you said you added panning right that's like exciting yeah yeah, yeah. how do you (laughs) balance we have much more than painting currently (laughs) yeah but like uh in the beginning i'm sure when you add panning like that's kind of a simple obvious thing Uh but there's probably a lot of things and and, you know i i've talked to people from ableton about it a little bit like um you like users want everything oh why can't you make users do do this do this add this feature but and one of like the things ableton's always very careful about is adding a new feature because they mm-hmm. don't want to disturb the workflow, they don't want to change things up too much for the existing users, and and the more you add, the more clunky it gets. So if you're yeah. having this thing that you want to be very accessible to a beginner, how do you figure out what do you add and what do you maybe decide? You know what? Um, maybe our audience doesn't need to have. I mean, I don't know if you have it, but like, say, like side chain compression, or yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, we don't how, have side. We have we have great compression, but no side chaining. But yeah, like, and it make, that aux, makes that makes sense. Channels, to, yeah, to, like maybe let's not talk about that. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. How do you make those decisions? Yeah, the um, it's such a good question, um, and it's super complicated, especially like maybe not especially, but like in, in most product spheres, but there's so much like technical detail and granularity, like in audio applications. Mm. And um, that it, it is super difficult to know where to draw the boundary. Mm. Um, and I totally like, 
I've always respected Ableton's sort of like slow and steady and really um, like concise and conscious like product decisions, you know? It's like the evolution, it feels slow, but it's actually like, you know, between eight and 10 is huge um, in terms of really subtle things. At BandLab, um, we, it's an interesting environment like compared to other, I guess, audio companies I've worked for, which have like more detailed product requirements and like a slower rate of development. For example, you can version a plugin, like you can, you know, and, or I can't open an Ableton 10 session in Ableton 8, right? Like right. users don't expect that, but something we have to balance also at BandLab is that when a user makes something on their Android phone with the most recent version of the app, somebody could open it on their iOS phone with a version five versions back. And we, ha and, and we have, we have to support it. We have to have some way of sort of like supporting every feature on every platform and have forwards and backwards compatibility. So that's like the baseline, which is a huge, you know, the product team, um, really spent so much time thinking about that experience because it's so core to ban them. Mm. And then, um, so we do releases every two weeks. So we like really on every platform. So we like really are rapidly pushing it. And I think that we, we treat our development and product process more, I don't want to say like a startup, but in my experience more, like it doesn't feel like I, my other experiences at audio companies, like we, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so we're like rapidly iterating and we also, um, like start to take basically like take into account all the different ways like our users are using the app and assuming that we don't know what the best option for them is. So it's kind of like the old adage where it's like, okay, we got a lot of requests for effects. Okay, maybe we just try presets. It's like, oh, we have even more requests for like adding effect parameters now, but we need to like be sure that um, like you, you want to stage it and increment it and be sure that the users are actually using it. You know what I mean? Because you can spend a lot of time and like churn on feet advanced features that people don't actually want, even though some people or don't use, even though people are saying that they want it. Right. right. And I think because like working in a little bit of a faster pace, we can feel out like what our users are actually using and actually want and experiment with things and try things in different ways. Mm. And that's like a really fundamental part of it is that like, as much as I plan, like when I make a product, um, for ban them on how the users are going to use it. They're not going to use it exactly like I think they will. Like it's, it's ridiculous of me to think that I know what's best for mm -hmm. over 10 million users now. You know what I mean? Like that's, so we have to, you know, just like be honest with the data and try out things and do a B testing and see what really works and like really listen to the users. So our product team is, it's really, um, we keep extending the features um, where they're resonating with mm. the users basically. Um, and yeah, the big limitation for us in terms of like really advanced features also is, you know, we're really like a mobile first company and it's a super powerful thing that everybody's walking around with like these crazy computers in their pockets that are now possible of like multi-track recording and like, uh, like all sorts of advanced audio editing and like, you know, but the interface is so different, yeah. you know, I mean, you can't, you can't, you know, people have tried many times to squeeze like a traditional DAW into a phone and it like, mm -hmm. it's just trying to use, you mm -hmm. know, it's just, so for us, the idea is to leverage like the web platform, you know, for more of the traditional editing and still offer like all the same features on mobile, but maybe rethinking how it works. Um, and like, yeah, I always try like, we talk about like Bana being like a good place to start your music career, like career and production, but there are a lot of advanced features and I'm always surprised about like how great the things people make on it are. And it, one of my professors said to me once, like never underestimate like your listener or like your audience member, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you're doing something way out there, like just put it out there and like people can understand what you're doing. And I think like, don't, I don't also want to underestimate the user. You know, I don't want to short sell our users. Like there's like millions of created and talented people and like, we should be listening to them. Like we're supporting them basically. Um, right. 
So it's a, yeah, I guess like a, it's, but on the day to day, like finding where that line is, is very difficult. You know, it's like, where should the button be? You know, like it's, yeah. there's so many variables. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, from my perspective, like, you know, I don't think about these things as much as like the user. You just, oh, that's where the knob is. That's where the button is. That's how yeah, you do yeah, it. Yeah. But um, to make it work in a way. And I guess too, if you are getting a lot of people that are kind of getting their first experience recording music and producing music, they, they're probably coming at it in a weird way too. They don't yeah. have that like foundation that makes you say, well, this is how you're supposed to use this effect it's supposed to maybe come at this point in the signal chain but a lot yeah. of and that's also like kind of the cool thing about being a beginner is you don't know the rules that you should follow so sometimes you break them in interesting ways yeah and that's like oh. it, it yeah exactly like those interesting ways that you break the current technology is like that's the stuff i love like you know mm. these like bedroom beat lo-fi hip-hop is i keep bringing up because we have so many requests for that i've been that but it is this like diy like playing with tapes like in a digital world ethos which mm -hmm. is like such an interesting like synthesis yeah. of nostalgia and like phones basically and they st people stream it you know and and um yeah the one of the interesting like just talking about some of the products we have at band lab and like our experiences with that um you know I think we both probably grew up in the world of skeuomorphic applications like reason or like, you know, we've all had wave waves plugins that like look like the thing that they're emulating, yeah. you know? And it, it, it's a, and when I started at band lab, I was like, Oh yeah, we have to make stuff like this. Like mm -hmm. look at, I look at, I, you know, I came multimedia, look at all these different companies. It's like an amp, you know? And now yeah. I'm like, this is not, you know, I, I don't really, my views have like radically shifted because it's not, it's not how people necessarily like re relate to sound um, in mm. the same way. Like, because it looks like an ally to a compressor, like doesn't, you know, what does that do? Like, yeah, maybe people will think it sounds great, but I found that like, you know, simplifying the interface often and having like sort of a sound first thing mm. approach, like really works with, um, like a new generation of creators i think that's like why ableton speaks to so many people currently is because they totally like rethought the approach to um the interface like it's so stripped down they have their own abstractions of effects and instruments like they reuse all of these components like it's gray it's visually it's not fatiguing mm. you know and like that's so that's been for our effects, we were worried when we release the effects that it's going to be too complicated and our users aren't going to know how to do it. Like, like the threshold of like different compressors and like, uh, you know what I mean? Like just basic, like the, it's difficult concepts to like get some of this, this stuff. But we found that our users like just like dove into it and are really using a lot of these effects and playing around with it and with like a simplified interface because you can move things easily and like hear what they sound like you know and same goes with like our midi editor on mobile you know it's it maybe doesn't look like a crazy advanced like midi editor but pe our users are really using it and it's like yeah maybe we don't need like x y and z feature you just need to see these blocks and you need mm -hmm. to be able to like sequence with them and like kind of a hybrid between like a clip launcher and like a midi editor you know what i mean like this is um and so yeah that's where like reduce and like keep the product idea focused and then like don't underestimate the users like provide you know they'll figure out how to use the tools but like <laughs> make it direct you know um so it's yeah well you hit on something that i've kind of uh struggled with a lot myself um this idea like it has to look like the real thing that it's emulating um and it's something that i really enjoyed about ableton live when i switched to yeah. it i was using pro tools i went to digital performer and i went to logic and you know, i loved logic you know i loved them all while i was yeah. using them um but every device you open in logic is a new look like everything yeah. inside live looks like something in live it has a similar has this just, just this continuity and it also yeah. abandoned this like metaphor of the tape left to right 
with the session view where you, you don't need to be linear. Like that was, yeah, well, they, that was the f- fundamental shift, you know, for yeah. the DAW user. Um, yeah. A lot of the, like visually like Bitwig um, also like really interesting, really concise. And like, I think um, m- most people in the industry are like moving in this way, like massive 10, like the mm-hmm. synthesizer, like it has this clean, like it's not um, versus like the older versions of massive, you know what I mean? It like, yeah, it, it's less. It doesn't look like knobs in the same way. Mm-hmm. It's less emulating physical realities and more like embracing that we're in this like sort of purely digital world, and we're constantly being accosted by like large, colorful ads and like loud noises, and you know, and it's like yeah. when you want to be creative, you want to like, you know, be yeah. in a state of receptiveness and listening, kind you know, of clean, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I I love my nest of cables. You know, I'm definitely not like a. <laughs> but yeah, on the work. computer, it's nice to have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh man, you just gotta cut them and throw them out if they don't work. What's you don't have, you're not gonna fix them. Yeah. yeah. I I you know I recently made a purchase over the Black Friday Cyber Monday month, <laughs> which it is and now. It's not like even a day anymore. It's like sales are still going on like it's two weeks later but um waves in particular was offering um it was an abbey road reverb for cheap like 29 or 30 dollars and i was like oh this is pretty cool and i was playing around with it um i did notice it was pretty heavy on my cpu but i really didn't like the interface it and it looks like yeah came out of Abbey Road in the 1960s or something. Um, but there's like this room and like you move the microphones and it's mm-hmm. it's definitely like a complex, like a lot of thought and love went into it. Sorry <laughs> to say, but I wound up yeah. I wound up buying um a Valhalla vintage reverb instead. Oh and, yeah. And the two reasons oh, yeah. were I, I thought they both sounded great. I really did. But um, I liked, first of all, Valhalla was much easier on my CPU. Um, the Abbey Road mm-hmm. was taking the little meter in Ableton Live up 10% when I put it in. And Valhalla yeah. was like maybe two. But the clean layout was just like, like I just, I know what I want to do. And like, this is easy. And, and like inside the Abbey Road one, it's got levers and sliders and microphones I can move around. Yeah. I, I was just like, it's this isn't fun to use. And I have the same no. frustration with, um, with my iPad when I use apps that it looks like the gear and I got to like turn a knob by like swiping and, the apps I like the best are the ones that are like rethinking the look of the interface for touchscreen. Like, you know, like it, it yeah. I tur- like I always get to this point when I'm turning a knob on the iPad where I get it like halfway and then it starts going back the other way. <laughs> and like, I oh, can't yeah. figure out like, and it's just like an annoying thing. Like, I'm just trying to move this thing real quick and now it's, it won't go that way. <laughs> I just like imagine like from my own experience, like how many hours of heated discussion like all audio developers have had about like knobs or sliders, like horizontal, vertical, or circular like mapping motion. Yeah. Cause like everybody makes is a different, slightly different decision. And like um and yeah, it's like the iPad is a radically different interface, like when you're using your finger to do something. And like it's ridiculous to think that, you know it's just not ridiculous it's like it's like having a ferrari and driving it like a peugeot you know what i mean (laughs) where it's like you can't you gotta make so you don't want to let somebody like use this same with like cpu performance and like you know we Mm -hmm. it's uh you know our computers and our devices are so fast right now and it's it's part of that but anyway to listeners everybody should check out valhalla because i think it's a great plugin i can't remember the guy's name who makes it but he has a wonder his on his website he's got a great blog about like how digital reverbs like actually work mm-hmm. and like his approaches to like things and it's super informative um for the technically inclined and and you know what that was another part of it 
it was the story kind of what we were saying before. Yeah. The yeah. story, um, I was reading his thing and, uh, you know, I kind of went on like maybe there's a Black Friday sale and um, yeah. and he's like, no, it's always 50. It's always Black Friday every day. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. like, it's a good price. Um, but the human of the product, you know, the human behind it, um, I, I just like, I wanted to buy from him. Yeah. You know? I wanted yeah, to totally. buy from him. And I, I was more satisfied really in using the Valhalla demo um, than the the Abbey Road one. And, and like Abbey Road, the album is one of my favorite albums ever. Yeah. And I wanted that a little bit, you know, just uh -huh. to like, you know, feel like I was a part of the Beatles or something. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But it, 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 it kind of like defeated itself in, in my mm. opinion. Um, you know, take it for whatever it's worth, but it just kind of, uh, I just really enjoyed using Valhalla more. And I, I felt myself just having more fun with it and getting to the point quicker. Yeah. It's, I mean, the, that's super important these days. Like, yeah. It's, it's just like, I remember being like super pumped on like trying to get like, oh my God, this looks like an API channel strip, you know? And like, yeah, ah, like it's fab filter EQ. Mm -hmm. Like it's beautiful. It's descriptive. It's simple to use. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Even the, you know, EQ8 and Ableton mm -hmm. or like it's, and um, yeah, just like having, there might be some fancy DSP under the hood, you know, but for equalizers, I'm not too worried about like, like the, you know, there are things that digital is so good for um, in terms yeah. of like, you know, just radically sculpting sound. And like, you know, that's yeah. another thing is like, I have philosophical qualms about like modeling, like if we're imitating things and then there's also like the technological side of it of like remodeling old gear, mm -hmm. Um, which we, we've definitely like done that at band lab and we've also like created like new effects. So, and it's been interesting to like see both sides of it. So we have like, sometimes like, like an LA 2 a compressor model, like re it sounds amazing. Like it's really great. It's competitive with any of the plugin versions, you know, and it's just baked into the app as this like little tiny effect with like three knobs and like a switch, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it's super effective. It sounds great. You know what I mean? Um, versus like we have a normal digital compressor that's like kind of just like a you know not based on like trying to model an analog device and it also sounds good and i guess i prefer the the analog model you know just for the sound quality um which is surprising to me in this case because generally like you know i like stuff like isotope does where it's like you know we're we're constantly pushing technology like the, the physical compressor that we're modeling was pushing technology mm -hmm. at its time. Like the LA-2A used a, um, actually like a light and basically like a light sensor to like cause the compression of the amplitude. You know, it was basically a night light. It's like, a you know, yeah. <laughs> so, and we're like digitally modeling this, <laughs> you know, and it, it's a kind of special, that's a special thing. But like we, you know, I really believe we, you know, uh, we should continue to try and not get stuck on, thinking about how things were in the grand old days, especially when we have, you know, so much technology around us. Well, I, I get what you're saying because um, there's like the, it's like modeling the inaccuracy of it uh -huh. where the inaccuracy sort of had like its charm, you know, but it is awesome. Like in, in a, a digital EQ on your computer, you can literally cut out everything below that cutoff, but on a real EQ, like, Something's still kind of slipping by, and there's yeah. a character added. It's going through wires and electronics. Yeah. So I mean, I love that. I love like do it for that. Like it makes me want to get the like. If you're gonna do it for that sound, like I, like I love just like lo-fi DIY. I love building like little synths and like making as much like little electronics things as possible. And like physically, yeah, physically, yeah. and like get this. You know what I mean? But it's like it's really doing, it's serving its purpose. You know, you're not imitating it in this other way. Um, so anyway, it's a big question. I think that's like why skeuomorphism has lived on so long in, in technology is because it's important sometimes to say like, hey, this is from this vintage compressor. Like in visually, like this is, you can see that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a, 
Well, I wonder, uh, there's, there's probably some tests that companies have done if like people are just enjoy it more, you get the same exact, you know, processing happening on the hood, but it has just like a old school like skin on it. Yeah, you know, I it's definitely better. I have a, a this can you see the Korg MS20? It's the mini that oh, came yeah, yeah. out. I, I like this is every time I talk about this, I feel like a nerd. But I, I got uh wood sides for it. I spent like forty oh, bucks yeah. or something online and it got looks wood so nice. Sides. And and I always joke around like it sounds warmer now. <laughs> yeah, you got that good vibe. I have a great story about this actually. Um I had worked for um, a previous company doing like uh, like guitar amp modeling and like some tab stuff and iOS and basically iPad and iPhone apps. Um, and we worked with this this guy who's kind of like um, his name is Thomas Serafini and he works on like DSP. You know, he really he writes guitar amp modeling mm. code. You know that people use. So this company was using it, and he was telling me this story. Um, about how he like, I'm not going to say like the name of the company, um, but yeah, he basically delivered like, oh yeah, like you wanted me to make all these crazy guitar app models for you. Like here's a delivery. Um, and it was a plugin and it had just like basically no user interface, just like drop down menus and stuff. And they were like, this is, sounds terrible. Like this is totally, <laughs> this is unacceptable. Like you deliver us something that we can't like the sound is so bad. Um, and so he apparently had like his like a friend of his do like a little graphic design mock or like and he put a nicer looking interface on it and delivered it with the same exact audio code and they were like the, it's so much better it sounds wow. so much better and that's just like you know a company with a lot of experience in making pro uh, audio products and like you know i have to be aware of that at band lab like of of, of how i'm how, it's it's part of it both in making the products and in analyzing the sounds of the things that we make mm. because it's like the interface affects how we hear it you know mm. um and that that's definitely like yeah i think it's it's a powerful thing so yeah which gets back to our like if you strip things back you can like you're kind of like hearing it in a less like in like I don't want to say like pure, but like less influenced visual way, you know, you can be more objective with it. Uh -huh. um. <laughs> That's really funny though. Um, yeah. I, I think about that a lot when I do um, my own sound design and my packs and stuff and like the preset naming part. It's just always oh. like, I don't know what to call this weird sound that I made. I <laughs> do know, a I, lot I, of naming, so much naming. <laughs> I, I wonder though, like, um, how much the naming of it it affects how people like it or how much just what I call the collection affects how people like it and it definitely does I, I know <laughs> it does and like it's uh that story you tell is, is is like it's a very funny there's a psychological point in there it's something of human psychology it's like we yeah you know we exactly we like the shiny thing or like uh you know the, the bright colors even if it, everything else is the same yeah it's uh at band that we like we deliver so much like every loop back you have an image you have a name you have mm -hmm. a description every effect preset has a name and an image you know we we, we want to deliver a content rich experience and we're delivering new audio assets every two weeks you know and they and it just like the naming, like think like working with the design team and like what the best image is. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the smart things we've done at band lab is we've kind of, um, we've, we've turned these all into their own little services so we can like change them on the fly without the user having to like, you know, reinstall the app or like update. So I can sort of change all the assets that are available to you at any given moment, like in the cloud. And it allows us to kind of experiment with like, um, like these assets and how like meaningful or impactful like yeah. this simple naming thing is going to be, you know. And I, I um, didn't give it enough weight. Basically, it's like a learning curve. Where now I'm like, oh yeah, like we, I, I really have to think about this because it serves the user. They're trying to find these sounds, and mm -hmm. like this is the way that they're associating, you know, with 
with the sound that they're trying to find. Um, right. So it's, but uh, there's no, so I don't have a solution, you know, it's yeah. <laughs> just, well, I, I got to see how many too. people are using it. I, I do the images for the packs I release and um, sometimes I'm like, I don't know. What do I do here? I have one I'm going to do an experiment on, and you know, it's not, I'm not trying to fool or trick anybody, but I, I have a pack called uh, Tuned Kick Drums. And oh, yeah, it's just um, kick drums that are tuned, and some of them you can play melodically, play like bass lines with them. Oh, nice. I think I'm going to create a new image for it and call it 808s. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and like, I didn't. I thought about that in the beginning, but I was like, well, an 808 is the whole drum machine, you know? But yeah. the, the common like terminology the people say boom. when they when they say 808s, they're talking about that that tonal <laughs> kick drum that like oh, shakes yeah. your speakers. That classic like sine tone bass drum, basically. <laughs> yeah, and like that particular pack, I really thought it was gonna be like a runaway hit. I thought like everyone mm-hmm. wants this, you know. I even want it. I don't even make <laughs> that much hip hop style stuff. I just think it's a cool sound. Uh, but it, it didn't like perform as well as I thought it would. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm just, I want to experiment with that and see if like, um, people react to it more as 808s compared to like, yeah. tuned kick drums, which is like really what you want. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> You'll have to see. Yeah, it's the, the um, slang or that like just that name. I guess it's it's weird, but I I have a hunch that because I've had people ask me, do you, do you have any eight oh eights? And I and uh-huh. I know they that they're they're not saying like, do I have like samples of an eight oh eight like with the snare and like cowbell and everything? <laughs> just yeah. want the kicks. Eight oh eight is so it's so ubiquitous that the the term has evolved. <laughs> like it well, means something. Yeah. Getting like back to like the kids at school, like. When I show them how to like make a beat on push, uh, I often just tell them just open up the 808 kit, and I'm like, you've, yeah. you've, heard, you've heard rappers talk about 808s, I'm like, yeah, what, what, what? <laughs> like this is the drum machine, like this is the drum, yeah, you know, so like you don't even have to be involved in like drum machine <laughs> enthusiasm <laughs> to yeah, it's just to like, know it. 808. 808. Yeah. yeah, it's like a thing. Everybody has to have an 808. We got a great 808 kit on Bandlam. I mean, you can't, you can't have, you can't make samples and not have one now for <laughs> yeah yeah well it's uh, uh, so classic it's for re- i mean like like i said i don't even really make that kind of music too much but i want one <laughs> you know? yeah totally you know? totally yeah. i'm kind of looking at like some of the reissues that have come out and like maybe that'd be cool i was at a music store recently and they had one i was like wow like it's huge you know and like and it's like it has a presence where like uh-huh. the reissues, even if they sound identical, like they just don't. The, like if you put that thing in a room and it's taken up all that space, and you have the same damn samples on your computer, and, and you got the yeah. remake that sounds ninety nine percent there or whatever, it's just like a statement. It's like here I am. My friend yeah. bought bought a Model D, the the Moog reissues. Oh yeah, did. and that thing like. Like you walk in the room and it's like, you know, yeah, it's standing it's there with there. its chest puffed and it's like, wow. And it's it's a beautiful piece of furniture and the big knobs. and it, Sounds great, yeah. And um, the, I have the Behringer Model D and, and I love it. And it sounds great. Oh, yeah, you like it, yeah. I really do. Um, I, you know, I don't, I know there's, uh, sometimes I feel guilty saying I have <laughs> just like, cause yeah, yeah, there's a like, the, well, there's a Behringer thing. Yeah. The, like that's a rip off or they're, uh, cheating or stealing or, you know, it's, um, yeah, habit. they have some press issues with some of their business practices. That's for yeah. Sure. I, I, I am, uh, I guess I'm like, uh, you know, uh, kind of like the feeling of like, I want the environment to be clean, but I'm going to drive a car that <laughs> pumps the, uh, yeah whatever i, guess it's a similar I don't feeling, know there's yeah. some sort of connection i guess but um it, it just doesn't have that same presence in the room as that that thing does like no it, like it, yeah the it's, the manufacturing has just like changed too like i mean for like the size of resistors is like different mm-hmm. the, yeah the way that the metal alloys are made 
is different. You know, where like everything is. Uh, I I think I remember seeing an image of like the old MS twenty, right? The Korg mm-hmm. like internals, and then the like reissue or the current one. You know, and it's so much smaller. Yeah, just because the components are smaller, and it like you know. It's interesting that like yeah, it's it's scaled yeah. down. It's got a schematically, it's in. the same. Yeah, yeah, totally. But like, it kind of is like a whole new. It's manufactured in the modern day. You mm-hmm. know? It's, so there's going to be some difference in presence. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Like old machines, even like um, you know, they just like an old car. You know, if you yeah. you see like an old. Ford Model T or whatever, you know, like uh, you're like, whoa, look at this, this old Cadillac yeah. from the 50s. It's like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's it's like probably four times as heavy as any other car on the market. Right yeah. now. And it just has that like weight to it, that presence. And yeah, maybe yeah, hard it, to reproduce. Yeah. Well, we should, we should, we can make a schemorphic plug in version of it. You know, that yeah. would be the best way to reproduce. <laughs> Somehow put that in the car. <laughs> that's funny. Oh man. Uh yeah, like that's like the the thing. You see all these like shootouts online too, where people comparing this and that mm-hmm. and on YouTube and getting all like I can hear the difference. But meanwhile, like your YouTube this the audio you're getting there is like compromised. Yeah, it's a hard the listening is like it's such an intense experience really like it's such a good i think it's like a deep practice which Mm. like i'm like not i'm like getting better at you know uh, over time like um and it yeah like when you're actually like how can you objectively like tell the difference in the sound Mm -hmm. and like there you know often it's so close that it's just like some psychological thing that's making you think it's different and i i always at bandland we did this interesting um experiment with our mastering so uh band has mastering which i i spend a lot of work on so you can like sort of algorithmically master your tracks in like a couple different styles and a lot of people like use it in the platform they like drag their music in maybe they have their own production stuff but they want to like be able to link it to instagram all the stuff get it mastered like mm. we'll make sure oh, that's cool you know, good for streaming but we wanted to do tests right with like so uh, uh, on um if people actually like it <laughs> you know because yeah. mastering is like it's so subjective like you're so you're like you're massaging somebody else's track into like a different state of existence like really like you know it changes a lot you know not like maybe the fundamental musical structures but like really like it can bring it to life yeah. um so we um one of the uh, um people working for band lab basically made some tracks and like he's connected with um, like mastering engineers and like audio engineers. And he had some other unnamed web service, I'm sure mastering um, our mastering service and then mastering done by professional mastering engineers. Right. And so it's like, okay, we have three really interesting data sets, you know, and you know, AI machine learning, whatever, like, I've been doing this for 40 years and then like our approach, which is like some sort of like hybrid basically. Um, and then the, he sent it to audio engineers to listen to and like choose their preferences of like, here's the original, here's the master versions of these three. And the data was completely like white noise. Like there's no, like the trained like engineers are choosing at that level, like so deeply on like their preference. Um, and And that's kind of like, you know, for me, that's like a win. Like when it's like, when you have this white noise thing, like then people are making their choices based on what they prefer. You know, you've, you've reached the state where it's not like, oh, this one is actually bad. Like this is objectively bad. Mm-hmm. It's now like, oh, it's within, you know, it's just taste at this point. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's pretty, that type of like detailed listening for mastering is, is pretty, um, yeah, it's its own practice. I think, yeah. Having worked on it, yeah. It's interesting that the results weren't like definitive or it just shows no, you. No, it was answer. not definitive. <laughs> of course we wanted like of course I would have loved to say like, yeah, band lab was chosen every time. Right. But like the you know, um to like launch a product 
that's like competing in a market with like much more mature products and also like um, people's like real world, like decades of experience is pretty cool. That said, like our, um, like one of our big for mastering, one of our big, like important points was that like, like we'll help you basically like master your track, but like, we're not replacing like a mastering engineer. Mm. You know, if you make something at band lab or like you're working on demo tracks or you want to just like yourself releasing some stuff like this is great. But like um, because we're like a social platform of creators, like we want to also say like, hey, here's a bunch of people who also do mastering like who can help you with like specifically what you need. Like mm-hmm. we're not trying to replace the human, which is um, another like I think, yeah, looping back into band lab. It's like a interesting part of like simplifying tools but like you don't want to like write out like humans basically Mm -hmm. from this process you know like i would recommend working with a master engineer like if you have the means to do that you know which is super rare (laughs) like you know in our current state of how music works um or the percentage of people that are making music that actually yeah yeah where they have like studio budgets where you can like Mm -hmm. you know so um but otherwise you should drop in that mastering because it could be great. <laughs> it it's interesting too. Like for me personally, I kind of like recordings that sound a little lo-fi and mm-hmm. a little bit maybe a vintage flavor. Like I don't I don't like super shiny, like I don't know, perfect is the word, but like clean, like I'd I just don't like that as much. I kind of like a little bit of grit. And that's yeah, me. Totally. And and like when I was working on my four track tape recorders and stuff, like I wanted like, you know, that like you can make a really bad recording on this. Yeah, yeah. But when I got to like doing the ADATs and especially the next step I did from the ADATs before computers was hard disk ADAT. Oh and yeah, yeah. They had the ADAT HD twenty four. The twenty four. Oh yeah, I remember looking at that on Musician's Friend when I was like seventeen. <laughs> yeah, I, I I sold the ADAT and moved up to that, and um, I loved it. And it actually had like you could cut and paste on it, like, and I, I mm-hmm. had notebooks filled oh, of yeah. mathematical calculations of like how long is my four bar loop, and I yeah, I mean it's hysterical i thought i was like this is amazing at the time but what i kind of like said at that point and it helped me move forward and just making music because um you know i don't consider myself like an engineer or anything like that Mm -hmm. um i i kind of use the recording tools to make the song it's they're Yeah, yeah they're the means to the end really so um when i was making an album on that um ADAT HD24 I said I'm not even going to worry about how good my recordings are like I'm not going to freak out about like mic placement and um getting I, I just like kind of took that off the table I was like whatever I do on this equipment is going to sound so much better than what I did before it's going to sound pretty damn good no matter what mm-hmm. you know like just because the technology comes so much further that I just kind of didn't worry about that. You know, I made sure like it didn't sound broken and like crazy yeah. buzzing or something, but you know, the washing machine wasn't on in the background. But I didn't worry about that. And it was, it freed me up. Like mm-hmm. once I had that mindset, I was able to just do the music. It's, yeah, it's, a, I had kind of a similar like experience, like working with my old. ADETs as well. Um, but basically, like, there was a, like, period where I had an inbox one, and I had, like, Pro Tools, and I still, like, had my ADETs, and were, like, using them, and then, like, tracking things out into Pro Tools in this, like, really backwards, like, mm. midi syncing, like, crazy way. And I would just, like, get so stuck in, like, trying to like over engineer everything in pro tools it's like the problem with like options yeah and i actually like it was so easy to do things but it was harder to be creative because like with the ada it's like i had to i had to nail this take 
I was, you know, I could spend like an hour nailing this take and like find something and really feel it. Or like, it's a little imperfect. Like it's just, it has this character of like performing in the moment basically, Mm -hmm. which is required. Whereas in Pro Tools, I, you know, I would start to like get into crazy minute details to like make everything so perfect. And it was a big lesson for me just in like, you know, on how, how sort of like having like these like technical, like deep skills and like making something perfect in the DAW and how there's definitely overlap to being creative and like making something, but it, they're, you know, they're two different circles, basically. Mm-hmm. Like they don't, you, you need to like maybe do that later. You know what I mean? So yeah. I start track, you know, like I start now and that kind of got into the process of like, I'm not going to like track and engineer yeah. and sound design and apply mastering all in this one session Mm. because i will never finish it and like i need to focus on like one aspect at a time which you know having yeah it's weird to think of like that was like adats were like inspiring for me to like think about like oh yeah like turn the computer off like just play the guitar like get the get the take in you don't have any of the fancy copy paste like Uh this is it (laughs) yeah there's a reason too why there were so many employees in the studio doing different jobs because I mean, yeah, when you try true. to do it yourself, you're you're basically doing the work of many people. I find myself fighting the perfection of the computer all the time now. I'm introducing a lot yeah. of the problems I was trying to edit out. I had the same thing with Pro Tools myself. Like, I got nuts, and then like when I finished a track and listened to, it, I was like it like didn't move me you know yeah like does it actually sound better it's, it's like, cleaner and, and like, what, like what i does don't that have mean? any yeah. mistakes but uh, like i like the old the one i did on my tape machine you yeah, know like there's something I, some magic that happens yeah yeah like uh, i think um there's a spirit of like when the thing is new too where mm-hmm. you're kind of like excited oh cool i got it let's move on to the next thing but when you suck that out by sterilizing everything yeah it's kind of like i always have this like process of like okay maybe like in my composition like process too it's like you have to like kind of make a score or like produce a track sometimes it's some thing but like so you make this thing it's this creative thing and like it takes me all this energy and I'm feeling so excited about it and then i finally make it and then definitely for the next three months i'm gonna think it's the worst thing that i've ever <laughs> done like it, it just like it's just every time like i have to yeah. give it space and yeah i think that's part and then like maybe after a certain amount of time when i have some fresh perspective like you can i can appreciate like what my concerns were and like see a lot more value in it and sometimes when i get stuck in that state of like oh i'm just like trying to make it like yeah I, i'm sterilizing it because mm. like i'm just trying to like I, I'm not giving it enough space, to like actually have it be what it wants to be. Mm. You know, I, it's more just like trying, like my brain trying to make it perfect versus like, okay, what is this song? Like, what is the character of the song? What is the energy of the song? And that could be very different when I give it space than when I'm obsessing about it, like trying to finish a track. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The, what, some of the favorite things of mine in recordings I love are like when you can hear the mistakes like oh uh, yeah like you can hear the seats squeak a little while they're playing the piano maybe or yeah or like someone coughs or there's like a scratch take in the back or something like that like human life it's Mm -hmm. very hard especially when you you're in real deep like that and you're getting critical over your own stuff and you're listening to you yeah you're self-conscious and it's very easy to edit all that cool stuff out. But like you said, like yeah. a little distance and you're like, oh, cool. I, I had a yeah. recording once where my cat, I was playing the classical guitar as a quiet part of a song and my cat was going through my legs and he had a little like jingly bell or something on his collar. Mm-hmm. And I was, I almost edited it out and redid it. But now when I listen to that, you know, like I'm like, oh, my cat, you know, like my old buddy, yes. there he is. You know, he lives on. And yeah. and that's like half of what I like about the experience of listening to the recording. Uh-huh. I read very recently, and I don't remember who it was. 
it's it must have, I don't, it was an interview with somebody that said I wish I could remember who so I could put it in the show notes but they'd said um they can't enjoy their music until like three months later after they forgot how they did it. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe I, maybe I'm having the same experience. I was like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, it's, I guess, the thing like is though you sort of you have to sort of like finish it though. I find it very hard to come back to oh, things yeah. that are old, so mm-hmm. I sort of have to finish it and then maybe leave it and then maybe I can like it again. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, that's it, like a. I think just to kind of like discussing like band lab as part of this too, like we um, it's interesting for me in like the past four years of like trying things out and like producing music mm. and saving it on band lab, like it's just like random tracks, you know, sometimes it's testing, sometimes I'm having fun. Sometimes I'm just like interacting with the community, but now there's probably like hundreds of them with like all these different saved versions and it's kind of fun to go back and like, it's like, oh man, like, what was I thinking like three years ago on track seven? You know, like, what was, what we, did we even have that sound then? You know, it's kind of interesting in the digital world, like kind of what we're talking about, like with how we save materials. Um, you can, you know, more intimately like dive back into like what the creative process was, you know, like, um, which is, is kind of cool. And I hope that, you know, that's also one of our intentions is like, you know, to become a hub where people kind of like store their, like, you know, it's a safe place to have like your creative work and to mm-hmm. like sort of archive it like over a period of time, which is, um, yeah, like a really, I think a good tool for like self-reflection on like, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, now, do you have to like export it or can you just kind of like, it's like just a, player kind of thing yeah we have like a player yeah yeah yeah. so um yeah and the two different sides of our app we would call it like the social side and like the mix editor as like Uh kind of like you can think of it as like the creation side and the social side it's all band um when you make something in the creative side you save it it actually sends out like all the samples and like the data for your production to a server that like generates a mix down Hmm. and will like master it and that's like part of um you know having this like generalized audio engine on all the clients like it's how we can make the cross-platform stuff really work and then yeah it generates this preview and it kind of drops it into like um yeah like i think a more traditional like player where people can comment and people can like it people can interact with it um if you make it forkable which is basically saying like hey this is like basically an open source song like people can open it and like remix it they can open it in this exact state of the mix editor that you left it in. So they'll have all of your tracks, like where you left all of your effects settings, Mm. like all the loops that you left in there. And it's kind of like, um, yeah, it's so much more than like, yeah, sharing these, like this audio file, you have like this whole, um, this like detailed snapshot of your session and then Mm. you can go back to it. We actually have a tree view where you can even like track the different, you know, branches like sometimes i you know i make something and i record a baseline and then i didn't like it i record a baseline again and there's like a branch in my history of my project um and so you know you kind of have both of those um and that's yeah it's kind of yeah it i it it feels yeah like version control almost but it which is like a but it's not like that in terms of people who are familiar with technology it's not as it's not like a yeah proper t- version control in that way mm. but that's cool let you just kind of you know like i've got tons of projects saved on the computer yeah. that i work on. I, I usually organize by month i just have like, oh, a yeah, folder yeah. for month month um but i in order to hear those you got to open it up you got to load it and yeah exactly like, it would be kind of nice and and i i don't know how i could expect anyone to do this for me because most of the things that I leave unfinished or just like clips in session view yeah inside live but it would be kind of nice if i could just sort of like click on the folder and just like hear what the idea was and then just, instead of yeah. opening it and playing it but in order to do that like, you have to sort of like put it in arrangement view and then export it yeah there was big that's that's a that's a it, it, a pain point with like 
a lot of audio products right now is this like does it exist in the mix down state or like in the multi-track state so like just inherently in band lab like we generate both and but one of the like um like when you save it we'll generate the mix down which is actually like it really intuitive for cloud computing right but like no other audio software does that mm. <laughs> like if you think it would be wonderful well, we can think back to like Splice, like early days of Splice when they were like trying to do these like Ableton multi-track collaborative things, you know, so you could like yeah. download somebody's yeah, Ableton you session. See and, the like yeah. uh, stems kind of. Exactly. But you had to like upload your own mix down of the track so it could yeah. play it back. And I think that's like, yeah, the plugin marketplace is great. Like their sound selection is like awesome. But like that thing that they, you know, we're trying at that point is that super powerful. And I think, you know, definitely at band that we were, you know, I'm thinking about that. Um, but it, it's hard to interface with other software because you can't, you know, you can't script it or you can't say, Hey, generate the mix down, mm -hmm. but something like that, where it's like generate mix down and save like automatically into like a temporary hidden folder. You know what I mean? And then you can integrate it with all these cloud platforms where it's like, yeah, here's your stems. Here's your, here's your mix down. You know what I mean? It's it's a small thing, but like you, you want to be able to preview it without yeah. having to open the software. And uh yeah, it's a really good that was always my issue with that that service of Splice was like I, I just want to save it and I want to like go through the projects online and listen to them and like that extra two minutes of like making my mix down. <laughs> yeah. It and like having to drag and drop it <laughs> along with it made me not use the service, which is like, you know an interesting thing for such a simple problem, you know? Right. So to all DAW makers, like please generate mix downs so that you can do all of this nice cloud storage things automatically. <laughs> well, so often for me, I'm, I'm working inside a live and it's getting late and I'm like, I should probably go to bed soon. And I push it. Oh, let me just try this other thing. And another half hour goes by and I've really, you know, missed my bedtime by quite a while uh, yeah, it'd yeah. be great i always like listening to what i do the next day on the ride to work and just to hear uh -huh. it it would just be awesome if like it somehow even though i didn't even put it in arrangement yet <laughs> if i could just yeah. somehow like just hear like kind of just like the gist of what i was doing yeah it's because yeah just like getting like the music production software stack is so heavy, like in general, like if you're running a lot of plugins and, you know, it's, it's Ableton's pretty snappy generally, but like, you don't, you know, it's, it, it takes some time to load all the samples into memory and to like get rolling and then to like get yeah. your monitors on, you know, it's like, it would be nice to, you know, have it. So anyway, on BandLab, you can produce music and then you <laughs> can play it from our player on the app on your way to work. And it's fun. It will always be there. So, and well, I definitely it won't necessarily be public unless you want it to. You be, make it which public. Which is yeah. that's the big. I, I think that's one of the big things. Is like not everything is public. Like we have a lot of different like privacy settings. So when you're like working on a track, like it still generates the mix down, but like other users can't see it until you're ready to like really publish it. Which is mm -hmm. like uh, I think um, an important note to make because it might sound like <laughs> everything is public all the time. Well, that's always something like with the uh, students I work with um, in school. Like, again, it's similar to me being up too late and I don't have time to do a mix down because I should have been in bed two hours ago. <laughs> but like the bell rings, they got to catch a bus in a few minutes. So they'll often be like, oh, I want to hear this, you know, like during the yeah. week. And I'm like, okay, I'll show you that how to do that next week because like, you know, you're not going to make your bus in the time for me to show you how to mix this yeah. and then transfer it to your phone. Uh, you this know. kind of like it touches on like um a bigger like interest of i think ours at band lab basically like these there's all these like little workflows right so like we you know we've been talking social features and like music production features but they're like um yeah like how do you aggregate like all the ways that people stay connected with into your you know sort of where you manage your music mm. right so like, how can you like share it with people, like share the files, have people play it, publish it, link it into your Instagram, like do Twitter links, like embed it in Facebook, like X, Y, and Z. You need to support like every way of doing that. 
and um and maybe you want to see like where your user bases are like where your listeners are coming from and like help you like sort of manage like your content as a creator you know and and, and um so we're kind of like moving more into this area too we have a product called uh, band links so bnd dot link and it basically like it's like a link generator and it's powered by BandLab. So you can like drop a one link in your Instagram and you can have, you know, links to your, all of your tracks like stored in BandLab or your sessions or even YouTube videos or your podcast links and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, that's a tool that's like maybe different than BandLab, like as a platform, but it supports the same like idea of like how people are, you know, really working with their music in the real world. We, a lot of our, you know, um, we've been talking to some of our users, we have these competitions and they're like, they're interested in promoting themselves on TikTok. Like, you know, they want to promote themselves on every platform available. They want to stream, they want to do all of this. And like, yeah, so like moving into like being a way for you to like create your content and manage your content and collaborate with people. But it also speaks to this like complex and ever-changing topography of like how, what you have to do to be a successful like musician. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you used to have a like an independent musician per se you know what i mean it used to like everybody used to have a wordpress and everybody used to like have a myspace <laughs> and like mm. those are long gone and like everybody like was using beatport and like now people are using splice and that you know it's changing and like what can be like a solid place that can sort of like integrate with all these other tools more easily and you know sort of so you don't have to worry about that. And that's kind of like, yeah, this ease of use thing is something I'm particularly interested in, like in the future of BandLab, like supporting artists outside of just the creation tools and just the collaborative tools. Like, hey, like it's complicated. Like we can help you get your music heard by people and like connect you to mm -hmm. this, like all of these different services, you know? So it's, um, that's, that's something that I don't think a lot of traditional music apps have like done, done at all. You know, um, the exports in SoundCloud, like, you know, like there's like, there's always like some like small thing, you know, Yeah. but there's so much more that can be done with that. Right. Yeah. And even that is like, you still have to go in there and you need your image. You need to, to write it up. Yeah. And, you know, it, and you can actually do all that while it's uploading manually anyway. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It takes some time. <laughs> But it is it is tricky sometimes to share music. Um, a lot of times people will send me their track and it's on Spotify, and I use Apple Music. Oh it's yeah. Like, oh well, do you have the you know like? Uh, there's some service. Um, I want to call it Linktree, but I think I'm confusing that with something else. But um, where it shows like your track and then it's got a link to like Google Play, to Apple, to oh yeah. Um, I can't believe I can't think of the name right now. Okay. Um. Oh but, yeah, it might be Linktree. Yeah, is it Linktree? I uh, think so. Um, but yeah, like that link, like uh, yeah, like aggregate linking. So like you know what I mean? There's just like linking. It's you have to like people have to think about these things because well, it's like it there's it, so much. Comp yeah, it. I feel like it's like I'm. These are all like uh, like digital dongles to like yeah, connect everything. Like like I have exactly, like, on this yeah. Mac that uh, needs those connectors and this connector and um, yeah, there's. There's like more robust competing services right now or like platforms that you have to like, hmm. you know, maybe that's a, that's a tax yeah. on your time. Even for me, for doing the podcast, I, ha yeah. I have to, I put it on LibSing and then I also put a post on my blog. Um, luckily, LibSing puts it to all the podcasting places, but I still want to put, I want to put like a little clip on Instagram or um, yeah. I'm going to upload the video to YouTube and it's it's just a lot of, little things i i've got it where um i try to it's it's about as much time as i could spend on it and still actually do the show <laughs> yeah but uh it would be super cool if it kind of like all went everywhere and just you know wherever you get your thing just get your thing yeah it's true i think like those sorts of uh yeah like efficiency tools are like so necessary right now for like producing content mm -hmm. like uh, yeah yeah so but yeah that and that's um i think yeah lots to say about that well it's it's a thoughtful feature i will say 
it's a thoughtful feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting. And uh, yeah, I was just like reminding me of streaming too. Of like, yeah, like I have like some streamers, like they want to like stream to four different services. So they're like, now services are becoming popular that you can stream to, which will stream to all of your different services. And, I like, know. I'm... It's a, yeah, it's a brand new world. Um, we just actually have um, this year uh, introduced streaming into Band Lab, which is an interesting hmm concept too which i'm um really excited about actually like people i love um like watching streams of people like produce music um it's like an interesting like new world of like getting to see like i've seen people like in ableton live or something and they're just like streaming themselves like making beats like oh i think the eq sounds good here like uh, it's watching people in real time like make these mm -hmm. like engineering and sound design decisions similar like you know it's like why people like stream people coding or like what playing games it's like it's like an interest of yours and it's actually interesting to watch somebody else do this yeah. in this like kind of intimate way and like talk mm -hmm. about it um so I, I just wanted to yeah the streaming reminded me of that i'm kind of interested to like you know see where that takes us mm. in like the uh, and, and that's also like another service that we like offer musicians uh, like as a way to self-promote themselves like you can drop a link to your stream on band lab right and then they can see your profile and they can see all of your tracks they can chat with you you know they can fork your projects you can drop links on instagram you know facebook you, you know all of this different things so it's like yeah that's um we're we're definitely like experimenting and like trying different ways like with the links to like work into like a musician's workflow <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. you know like um and it's like a mobile first world like you know, all, all like all of our integrations are like with other mobile apps you know it's like this is this is the what it looks like now you know yeah. and it is a, a, a strange new world we have yeah i, I don't know I feel, it makes me feel old now it's exciting yeah I yeah just like, I'll, i feel old every day <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I see what uh, my students do um I mean, this, like, it, it has to be social for them. I mean, yeah, you know, that's like what everything is. It's, they're so connected to a degree mm -hmm. that's like makes me feel like alienated <laughs> in a weird way. Like, I don't, I'm like, wow, you guys are like, your world is just so different. And yeah, I mean, I, I really think like it's like Wikipedia is like basically a part of all of our brains now. You know, it's mm. like one tet, like so much information. It, it, if I mean, if you have the thing in your hand all the time and you can at any time ask anything, like it's yeah. it's it's almost like just having that chip right in your head. I know, yeah, right. I'm sure, yeah, that's basically what it's gonna be like. Yeah. We're just like living, like it's a um, like it just cha like even like our brain chemistries. I'm sure, like and like how like different generations of people have like interface with technology and it's like super exciting that like mm. you know i'm not i'm definitely like um i think it's so exciting that there's so much information like available and like ways to connect with people like in these digital ways you know mm. and it and it can really like also add value to like our like analog personal lives you know because it's like when i when you do get into the habit of like yes notifications off like no computer today like it's it is really nice you know what i mean yeah. and like um yeah if it's like that all the time it wouldn't feel so nice so, like, you know well i think we're seeing an emergence more and more of like um conventions and gatherings mm -hmm. around certain specific things um, whether it's like ableton loop or even yeah like that's name a great or like um um like synth fest and like there's all these yeah. like obscure like very specific yeah. things coming up all over the place um and it's like you kind of can't make that happen without all the digital connection but yeah when it gets really cool is when you have the in-person connection i mean like doing this podcast like here we are talking across the country and yeah um when i went to ableton loop last year I, I had like a lot of friends that I had spent an hour having a conversation with that I met. Yeah. It's like, oh, what's up, man? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, we had a good time talking, and it was really cool. Like, it it would it would have been a lot different without that, you know? Yeah, it's um the one of 
like our we have this like beloved customer support person at Bandlab named Eamon. And recently we did this like competition where um you know people would like submit like um singing over beats, basically this competition to like win like production time with some like really well known producers like in Atlanta. And nice. um like everybody's like Eamon like he was so popular and like he's such a part of the community like and you know and to meet like face to face you know this like mm. you, you've given us so much product feedback like oh i love this track like i'm so glad you won this competition like there and like the, it's like you know you know it's like it, it's really nice to see like the ecosystem fostering those like real life connections mm. yeah. um and that's one of the um um features we actually have on band lab to um that we you know as you can see we like try out a lot of different things we're like very concerned with this like every this two weeks. landscape right now <laughs> yeah yeah every two yeah. weeks we do releases not every two weeks it's we release wild. features yeah. but we um it yeah so like you can you know um basically like you can allow if you want to find like collaborators like make music with like in your area mm. um it's like possible to do that so um if you like set your profile up for that so it's like, you know, yeah, I can find digital collaborators, but like also we want to support like, hey, I need a bass player like in Oakland, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And like, I can like find bass players that have like are interested in doing collaborations in Oakland, like through the BandLab app. And like, that's a, yeah, like that type of um, like human interaction, like, yeah, like how do you branch out into that? Um, and this is one of those ways. And, yeah, having these like gatherings of where, where like, you know, people, we can actually meet the users um, in person is like a, a super great thing. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it really, you know, like people often, a lot of the friends I've made in my life are over some common interest. Yeah. You know, so it's nice that um, even though like you might not be able to find someone in in your grade or your town that has that specific interest, like, that doesn't mean there's not millions of people all yeah, over. Totally. Mm. Um, and it, yeah, it's interesting at BandLab too to see like it's such a global like user base. Like it like it's really popular in India, it's really popular in Southeast Asia. Like it's I think the US is our most popular region, but it's um like one of our most trending genres is like reggae right now. Mm. You know, it's like so totally it's one of those things where it's like um like yeah like it's such a globalized like community as well and and that also means like of course i don't know how the user can use the app. that's why like i can't underestimate yeah. like don't underestimate the users because like that you know we could have fundamentally different conceptions of like how like music is made you know right. and like what is your job as somebody who's making a product for like a globalized community of creators and, and like you know you don't want to tell them how they should mm -hmm. be making things. You want to like listen and be like, oh yeah, like reggae is really popular right now. Like I never would have thought like reggae would have been like really, really popular. I mean, like, yeah, it makes sense. But like, you know, it was, then maybe it's surprising that it's like a really hot genre right now. And like, what can we do to support that? You know, um, yeah. and just like not be like, hey, we know reggae is really popular. Here's 20 new country guitar tones. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. which is kind of like, and it was trial and error at the beginning, to be honest for us of like, is our guitarist going to use the app? Like, you know, that was like, is this, is this like, yeah, you can plug in your guitar to your phone and play some like sweet guitar sounds in band lab. It's really great. We have interfaces for it. Um, but then like taking a look at how people like are in fact using the app and it's like such a like, you know, different spectrum from what you know our imagined you know or just yeah. like just building it from scratch and we need these tools and like this is the type of like people want grand pianos right it's like no not really like the yeah. the your like lo-fi hip-hop kit volume two which is like just totally distorted like 808 sounds or something is like 10 times more popular <laughs> than that like <laughs> um so uh, yeah that's a an interesting and cool theme that comes about a lot when I talk to different developers and people that are making things for other people to use to do music. It's 
the, they're always excited by the surprise cases. Like, I never thought yeah. they were going to do that with it. Like, we didn't yeah. intend that. But wow, look at how that, like, kind of like, it's like what happened with like the Roland 303. And yeah. it's supposed to be a bass for your guitar. But then, like, people made acid music, whole genre. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, pretty cool. I want to let you uh, let you go because. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, we've been we've been we, stream we, of counter talking for a long yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been great. Um, I appreciate your time, and it's nice to like uh, you know get an understanding of what you guys are doing and and uh, how people can use it. And yeah, it, it's yeah, a great well, thank thing you for having me. I think it's cool for it can be really useful for anyone. It's a cool social media platform, even for more established artists to just kind of. Throw some ideas that, out yeah. and um, get some community interaction. You know, the, you, the fork your song. That's the uh, terminology. The yeah, like yeah, sharing kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can share. You can invite collaborators. You can make bands. Yeah. All the things. Um, it's nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. It was yeah, super excited to talk about you know all the different things we talked about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. And, I enjoyed it. And, I, I was surprised to see how late it was already. <laughs> oh yeah, and um, yeah, definitely. Listeners, yeah, check out BandLab. It's bandlab.com. And uh, yeah, it's free. And like, I just, yeah, we're excited to see, like I said, like how people are like, actually deciding to create with it. So mm. I'm going to show it to my club next week. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I'll yeah keep let me know how posted. it goes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. So we'll say goodbye to everyone and then wrap it up. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Um, check out bandlab.com. It's, uh, like you said, it's free. So, um, it's a it's a cool tool, and I think there's some nice creative potential for it. And it might even be like maybe you got a a younger sibling, nephew, friend, turn them on to some music, let them have some oh, yeah. fun before they get bogged down with uh, you know learning how to read music and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>